G'day everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director here at the Australia Institute and welcome to our new show for Australia Institute TV, Pole Position with Guardian Australia and Essential Media. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that Canberra is not a wall country and pay my respects to elders past and present. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, and uh, I guess acknowledge the millennia upon millennia that Aboriginal people have cared for country here and the fact that we still don't have a treaty, a voice to parliament or any kind of Makarata truth-telling process. Uh, as you will know, the Australian Institute does these webinars at least once a week, hopefully most times, but days and times do vary. So uh, please check out our website to find out when our additional webinars are coming up. We do have another one tomorrow for everyone like me who gets depressed about climate politics in Australia. I think this will be a really good one. It's with Saul Griffiths and Danny Kennedy, two Australian clean tech entrepreneurs who are currently based in the United States. And it's going to be all about the possibilities of what we can do to shift the economy and electrify everything and not so much the quagmire that is Australian climate politics. So I hope you can join us for that one tomorrow. Just a few tips before we begin to help this run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function uh, where you can type in questions for our panellists today. You should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments as well. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will go up on our website um, after today. So this is Poll Position, where we give you the inside story on what's going on in Canberra and what the public actually thinks, not what politicians say they think. And I want to welcome our regular guests, from The Guardian uh, and from Essential Media, Catherine Murphy, the political ed editor of Guardian Australia, Pete Lewis, the executive director at Essential Media and his colleague, John, uh, from Essential as well. Thank you both for joining us for this deep dive into the latest political polling trends. Catherine, I'll start with you. Uh, they say a week is a long time in politics, but I don't know about you, this last year feels like we've fit about a decade of news <laughs> and politics into a year. Victoria's in lockdown again. We're only a few weeks out from the budget. The G7 is approaching. There's a lot happening. What's yeah. been going on? Oh, well, a lot, as you said, Deb. Thank you. Um, that, that sets it up quite nicely. Um, <laughs> yes, feels like several decades, really, since the last time we were all together. Um, but no, it's only really a fortnight. And the main sort of issues in that fortnight were, uh, was, uh, I guess, the government coming under increasing pressure over the pace and efficacy of the vaccine rollout. Uh, and we also saw, uh, once Victoria went back into lockdown, we also saw the acting Victorian Premier, Premier I think, rewrite the rules of engagement on, on the politics of the pandemic by being very um, openly critical of uh, the failures of the Commonwealth in terms of uh, the vaccination rollout and the, and the lack of quarantine facilities. Um, there's been a lot of gritted teeth from the premiers over all of the months of the pandemic on various issues, lots of gritted teeth, but very few outbreaks of public dissension between the jurisdictions. And I think uh, what the Victorian government signaled this time is that uh, when, there, when there are genuine frustrations or disagreements, they may be verbalised rather than, than not. Uh, and that uh, was part of the reason uh, that the Morrison government started chasing its tail both practically and politically and had to reboot the vaccination program by the end of the fortnight. So it was actually quite an interesting fortnight in that sense. Also, we had a uh, parliament sitting in Senate estimates, which is always pretty gruelling. And that estimate session immediately after the budget is the most gruelling of the estimate sessions. Uh, and there were lots of bits and pieces that came out of that, but uh, bits and pieces sort of shedding a bit more light on uh, Brittany Higgins, uh, some of the processes around uh, what, what happened in the immediate aftermath of the alleged sexual assault and also of what the police have been doing since. So there were bits and pieces there. Um, and as you said, I think, Eb, uh, while all that was happening, uh, Scott Morrison was gearing up for the G7 talks, uh, which are now imminent. Uh, I think the Prime Minister is scheduled to make a fairly significant foreign policy focused speech in the next 24 hours. 
setting up that trip. And the G7 will be fascinating because uh, Australia will um, come under pressure uh, about our climate change record, at least to some extent. I think during that conversation in Cornwall, it'll be the first uh, time that Scott Morrison has met face to face with Joe Biden since the presidential election. They are having what is called quaintly in these things a pull aside on the sidelines of this event, and that will be their first face to face. Also, the Prime Minister is spending some additional time in London to try and sort out a free trade agreement between Australia and the UK. Uh, and I think Boris will probably chew the Prime Minister's ear about climate. Um, the PM is then also going to France for um, a separate program with Emmanuel Macron, uh, where they will have a conversation about submarine contracts. And also, I would think Emmanuel Macron being Macron uh, climate might get a berth as well, I would think. In those conversations, also the PM is is dropping in via Singapore, uh, which is uh, an, a, an important visit always. Uh, but uh, the, there'll also be some discussion, I think, between Australia and Singapore about the long mooted travel bubble between our two countries. So, yep, it's all happened, and it is all happening. It is all happening, Pete. Uh, a lot happening in terms of. Uh, politics but what are we finding in the essential poll this week is that reflected in in what we've we're seeing look my take look, and we'll go through the, the the individual slides in a second my, my big picture takeaway and you started off the a year is a long time in pandemics is that i think the the relationship between people and government is kind of it feels to me it's back to normal so we had a weird year where we had an external threat, the pandemic, and the government was the problem. What I observed and what comes through in the poll is government is no longer necessarily being seen as the solution to an external threat, but more the cause of the next wave of the pandemic. And I think the figures, particularly coming out of Victoria this week, which we'll go through in a sec, show that last year, the worse things got, the more we turn to government. Yeah. I think this year, the worse things get, the more we're holding government accountable for particular policy failures. And, you know, we've got the vaccinations, we've got the quarantines. And I, I also think, as Catherine said, the that, that sense of national unity is really fracturing. And um, the language that both the Victorian um, government um, acting premier was directing at the Commonwealth just would not have been countenanced. Not, not that necessarily that they, they weren't feeling some of these things last year, but they just wouldn't go there. Whereas I feel that it's a it's a return back to a bit more of a political context. And if you're an opposition party, um, that's probably um, good news if you've got any hope of breaking that clean sweep of incumbents. Yeah. Than, so we've seen elections last year. Yeah, so we've seen it's been a very hard time for oppositions. And as you said, people kind of very encouraged, I guess, and uh, a return to a lot of uh, faith and trust in uh, government as the answer and everyone kind of, we're all in this together and and that kind of a feeling. And you're saying we're kind of shifting away from that. We'll go well, into the polling yeah. now. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, so, Pete, mm -hmm. I might come to you first on this one um, and tell us what we're seeing in this, this first slide here. So this is um, our work of art that um, we've put together over the last more than a year now, which every fortnight we've been asking that question, how would you rate the federal government's response? Um, and the light blue line is um, quite good. The dark blue line is very good and you don't need to be John Remington or a maths genius to add that up to show that um, by and large, over the last 12 months, people have been happy with the way the government's been going. Now, what you'll see here, um, we started off, if you remember back in the time of chaos, where there was just 45% um, combined, very good and quite good, um, uh, were approving of the government performance. If you put your mind back to like March, it was whether we were locking down or going to the footy. So there was real confusion with the messaging early on. But the government, to its credit, took the um, advice of public health experts. They moved. Um, they then took the advice of unions and the opposition to provide income support for people who had been affected by the lockdown. And 
the dividend for that you can see over a 12 month period where if you put those two lines together and you're closer to 70 than 50. Yeah. Um, what we are now seeing is a little bit, particularly of the very good, a downward slide down to just 15% sort of giving you a gold star um, and another 38%. So 43%, we're back at the lowest level really since the outbreak of the pandemic in terms of um, uh, approval or endorsement of, of the federal government response. Um, it, it sits with a couple of other slides we'd get to, but what is really driving that downward trend is um, a catastrophic drop in support in Victoria. So maybe if we just go through those two and then throw it to Catherine. So the next one yeah. is state governments. Again, the gloss dropping off, although, you know, if you're in WA and the gloss drops down to 75, it's hardly a, you know, <laughs> a point of soul searching. Um, New South Wales, you know, you can see which of those states has had um, a lockdown occur over the last couple of weeks. Um, so Victorian government support down to 48%, which is down from um, closer to 60. And then if you go to the next slide, which I think is the real, you know, this is Victoria, support for federal government. And that's combining those two lines. It's just 42% of people now thinking the federal government's doing a good job, 48% thinking the state government's doing a good job. In short, I think people in Victoria are pretty over it. And some of the um, viewers of this are probably part of that cohort. And um, they're taking that out on the government and government is no longer this, um, you know, this um, concept that, it, that, that transcends party politics. We're back into, into a, a real context here. Yeah, Catherine, you were talking there about much more focus being on the vaccine rollout and that real change with the state premiers kind of uh, airing some of their grievances. Is that what you think we're, we're seeing here? We've shifted it, you know, we're past that initial crisis phase of the pandemic? Yeah, well, we're sort of, well, both we are and we are, Deb, I think is what we're seeing here. We are in the sense of uh, the, the the politics of the pandemic have shifted and, and that's uh, sort of both in terms of uh, where the public's at, but also how the jurisdictions in Australia are speaking to one another. Um, but I think uh, it's the it's the reality that we're not out of the pandemic that is that is settling on people more forcefully, and that would explain some of the fatigue in Melbourne, uh, which of course is a city and a state that's borne more than its fair share of uh, of um, you know of, of trying to suppress the virus, right? We all owe a, a debt of gratitude to Victoria for truly heroic, <laughs> heroic efforts to suppress uh, infections uh, in the state. So I think yeah, it's sort of a weird concept to try and put across economically, but it's, yeah, that we're, we're not sort of, we're, uh, the pandemic's not over. People understand that now we are at the midpoint of this thing if we're lucky. Um, and that the tail might be longer than we all thought, uh, and it will go on impacting our lives. But also, um, the the sort of fatigue associated with the the pandemic, uh, just call it a patience dividend with governments, either federal and Victoria, also starting to wear a bit thin. You know, people are people are tired psychologically. It's kind of like they're not as inclined to shrug off what they would regard as suboptimal behaviour by their government, either federal or Victorian, uh, as they were a year ago. I mean, that's my take. Hey, Catherine, I reckon there's also something about the leave pass. Last year, people were prepared to give government at both the federal and state level a benefit of the doubt that I've never seen um, in my watching of politics over, over many decades. So governments were, it was okay to make mistakes. It was okay to reload because we were in such foreign territory. And it strikes me that those rules, it, 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 it strikes me that those rules are no longer applying. There's much greater accountability for um, decisions that government makes. Now, that can be um, an issue for, um, federal government when you come to things like planning for the vaccine or quarantine also for states if there's issues with contact tracing um mm -hmm. but it seems that i don't know if it's a return to normal um we always used to last year talk about what how was the dismount going to be and part of that was the dismount in terms of 
getting the economy not to be being held up by government pumping money in and really that hasn't stopped although though it's been pushed back in, in in key areas but also the dismount back to normal politics and how that plays out and whether it just goes back to kind of the old contest or or whether there is something here that labor can um capitalize on which strikes me as being that you know particularly this government isn't really showing a commitment to long-term government planning around the rollout of not just the vaccines and the quarantines, but also the manufacturing long-term of vaccines and just that whole sense of, okay, government's handled the crisis, but how does government now drive also the rebuild? Mm. Sorry, if that's a statement or a question, but yeah, yeah. No, like we went full Q and A there. I'm not oh, sure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Question or a comment? Anyway, take charge, Ed. Yeah, yeah. no, Catherine. I was gonna uh, picking up on Pete's point there. Um, you know, we've had the vaccine rollout now that's not going well uh, with the Victorian lockdown. Obviously, you've seen that drop in uh, support in in the poll there. Um, but is there a problem here with follow, follow through, which I think Pete was alluding to there, where the government, you know, is making big announcements, but when it comes to the crunch, people can see that actually the, the delivery isn't there? Yeah, it's partly that. I think it's sort of, um, and, and it's, it's kind of curious to think about why uh, we were prepared to give governments a leave past at the start, but we're less prepared to do that now. Well, I suppose the sort of intuitive answer to that is that we're 18 months in. So everybody feels like everybody should be learning, I guess. Uh, and so if um, there, there's not a lot of tolerance, I think, uh, or the polling suggests to us that there's not a lot of tolerance when uh, people do things for political reasons rather than for uh, practical management of pandemic reasons. So um, I, I think there's a bit of that. It's sort of like, well, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not at the start of this where, as I said, at the midpoint, if we're lucky, um, there's, a, there is a, there's a set of, there's also a set of community expectations, I think, uh, that governments have created, that governments in Australia will work together, will provide a safety net for citizens, will try to cushion the blow of this thing. And it, and if if somehow we sort of end up in a more chaotic or less empathetic or more austere place than that, then the public bash, backlash to that, we, we see a public backlash to that. So in yeah. a way, governments are kind of pri prisoners of, their, of the expectations that they set early in the pandemic in a, in a weird way. Um, Pete, is there anything you want to say here about the approval ratings of Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese? Mm -hmm. Look, I think what's interesting is we have had that notable drop off in regard for government performance, but there hasn't been a huge change in either the approvals of either side. Um, the way I interpret that is that I think there is a chink opening up for the political contest, but I wouldn't um, overstate the impact of that yet. Um, if you look at this sequence, the um, approval did drop March, April, um, around and, and you know that's not insignificant an eight percent drop and you know over um a two-month period an 11 percent drop um for the prime minister that was when i guess you know the that that sort of gumbo of gender issues was bubbling a, along and um i think the numbers then show that the government did manage to stabilize that at least in terms of the prime minister's um personal um reputation um, as you know, and I don't know if you're, you're, all, you're, all the people on this call know, is we don't do the horse race two-party preferred anymore. We do a series every three months looking back in the rearview mirror. So, um, again, I don't, you know, and news polls running, they still do horse race at 50-50. I think our numbers are not dissimilar. Um, so, you know, there, it's, it's not as if this, you can have trends being identified that that talk to a shift in political dynamic but the idea that all of a sudden that leads to changes in voting intentions or huge change in, in leadership perceptions probably don't hold if you just go back to the elbow one yeah. what's really interesting there is still the large number of people even though you've been in power you know through the best part of um 
help me here, Catherine, two years since that horrible yeah. night in May 2019, there's still 25% of the electorate that don't have a view on him. Um, 39, 36 kind of jury out with a bunch of people um, to be convinced. And then if you go to the preferred prime minister, which was the next slide, sorry. Um, That's right. You know, Morrison is still significantly ahead, um, which partly the incumbent effect, partly what you see normally when a prime minister's up on the head to head, it's why it's regarded as not the best, you know, indicator because one of them is being prime minister and the other one is only, you know, a proposition in front of people. Um, although dipping below 48 is not, it's not usual territory, but, he, you know, um, it's been sitting there up around just above 50 for most of the past year. Um, I think, you know, there was a narrative, I think, for most of last year that it was impossible for oppositions. I think these numbers say it's not impossible. And the scenario that sees a really tight political contest leading up to the next federal election is not outside the realms of possibility, particularly if this is not the only you know, lockdown we experience over the next year. And the experience elsewhere in the world is until people get vaccinated, that's probably likely. This was the other question that John threw in this week to make it a bit spicier. Um, whether views of the Prime Minister have changed over the last um, 12 months. Um, and I don't know if, John, you've got any interesting cross tabs. Obviously, it's going to be um, more so amongst people that don't vote coalition, but 40% all up say that they've got a diminished view of um, Morrison's government, 25% um, more favourable, 35% um, have not changed. I think among coalition voters, that number on less favourable was around a quarter, so it's not insignificant. So, again, just a bit of the gloss, and I guess, again, back to that earlier statement that last year government was not really a political thing. It was more an institutional thing, and whoever was holding the conch was the government and benefited from it. I think it's back to being a political proposition. Catherine, would you agree on that? Yeah, I think uh, yes. In broad terms, uh, I do, and uh, and yeah, that's my memory that it was in terms of the cross tabs that it was twenty four percent. I think of coalition voters that had changed their view. That's obviously not insignificant. It's it's not an insignificant percentage of people forty percent, obviously in any poll, uh, saying that they view the government less favourably today than they did. Uh, you know, 12 months ago. But still, if we add up the uh, tempering this, uh, the, the, these these judgments or these this analysis, uh, 60 percent of the 60 percent of our samples say they're either they either view the government in the same way or more favourably than they did 12 months ago. That's off a high base too. Off a high base. That was when we we're on the happy gas. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, like, if you're Scott Morrison at this point, you're banking that. You're banking that 60% or mm. sure. Um, there's also in terms of just how this translates to electoral politics. And I'm not, um, you know, sort of, if I take one step back, I think there is a contest because uh, not because I have feelings about things uh, or, uh, you know, I get visions. I just look <laughs> at what's in front of me, right? The government is acting like there is a contest. The government is absolutely acting as though there is a contest. So, but... Uh, if we put these all of these bits and pieces together, so we've got 60% in our sample say they feel either the same or better than they did about Morrison 12 months ago. Where Morrison's come off is in Victoria, that's in a state where Labor already overperforms. So it's uh, if you're Morrison, you're certainly not comfortable, mm. you're certainly not sitting there... Um, you know, uh, playing backgammon or, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, I don't reckon Morrison plays backgammon. <laughs> I don't know. I was just trying to think what, Mor what Morrison would play. Um, oh, let's, let's go um, to the chat for that. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Suggestions yeah. in the chat for sure. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't got a good thought about what Scott. <laughs> <I'm not playing. laughs> but, but in any case, I don't think he's playing it. I don't think he's comfortable but at the same time here, I think if you're Morrison, you'd bank the 60% and you'd say, we've come off in Victoria, which is a state where Labor already overperforms. So we're, we're, we're okay. We've just got to double down. We've got to fix the problems in the vaccine rollout and hope that incumbency gets us there. Yeah. Is something a bit, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the other way of looking at that last slide is actually your bank of political capital. 
um, off a real high last year, it's saying that you've run down about 40% of the tank of, of, of the capital. It's still, you're right, there's still 60% left in the tank and the question, and, and you're right too, Catherine, it's lumpy. Um, what really stood out from those earlier figures was if, you know, and you're right, if you take Victoria because it's in lockdown, the government's pushing down now, if it goes back to what we used to call normal, maybe that, that rises up again. But as long as there's not outbreaks in, in, in Queensland um, and New South Wales, I think the government's still pretty confident that they've got a pretty sort of strong Maginot line of what they can hold mm, and exactly. hold the power. It's the right, it's the right analogy, yeah. Yeah, and the challenge for Labor is just to find seats, not just to find numbers, but to find seats. And the seats are hard to find and they always have been, and particularly after the 2019 election where a lot of those Queensland seats went from being one or two percent to being seven, eight, nine percent yeah. for the yeah. coalition. Yeah. There's it's it's a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift, people. It is true, uh, but I always like to remind people that uh, in politics nowadays things are a bit different. And Campbell Newman in Queensland went from being, you know, a landslide election winner to loser within one term of government. So. Campbell Anything was very is possible. special, though. <laughs> um, we've got about 630 people on the webinar with us today. So thank you so much for joining us for this inside scoop on what's happening in politics. We're going to go back to the slides now. We've been talking a lot about um, uh, the latest Victorian uh, lockdown. Uh, and I think we've got a couple of questions here, Pete, that go into vaccinations and, and that type of thing. What are we seeing uh, here in this slide? Well, we're seeing that more people reckon it might be a good idea to get vaccinated, vaccinated sooner rather than later. Um, so the, the vaccine hesitancy has been a real thing. And I think that's been driven by a couple of different factors. A, poor messaging from the government. Second, a sense of complacency that there wasn't... Um, <coughs> A virus running amok in Australia, so we could we could take our time. Um, what is stable is that cohort who will never get vaccinated, the thirteen percent. Um, but there's definitely been a shift over the last month um, from those who thought they'd do it whenevs to they'll do it sooner rather than later. Um, and I don't know if we want to bring John in for a fun fact here. He was particularly looking at younger people and vaccinations. Have you got anything there, John? Yeah, so there's a couple of the big shifts that happened between May and June. Um, one of them is Victoria, where I'm in Melbourne. And again, there, the shift to getting vaccinated as soon as possible, quite <laughs> um, realistically, has happened um, very quickly. So Victoria shifted from 37% either would get it done as soon as possible or have already done it, up to 56%. So now over half of Victorians want to get vaccinated as soon as possible have already been done. So that's the highest of all states in line with New South Wales, but higher than the other major ones. Um, the other shift, which is hopefully quite promising, is those um, people aged 18 to 34. So again, in terms of getting vaccinated as soon as possible, that's gone from 32 to 45 not quite as high as um, the older age groups, but certainly a lot higher. But from the people who've said they'd never get vaccinated again, 18 to 34, that's gone down 20% to 15%. So we are seeing a shift there. That it's gone down 20%. It's gone down from 20%. From 20%. To 5% <laughs> drop, yeah. So that's a lot. Um, overall, I think that we never get vaccinated was just over 10%, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think it was. So 18 to 34 is so a lot more in line with that now. So it's good that there's um, a lot more eagerness and willingness to get vaccinated. Yeah. And uh, this one about uh, whether or not vaccinated people, whether they count as vaccinated, whether they've had only one or two doses. Mm -hmm. Why'd you put that in there, Pete? What was the interest well, there? It's just that semantic debate at the moment and the stats the government's, you know, coming out and, you know, we know you can't be half in love. Um, I think most people are saying you can't be half vaccinated either. So I know there's been a bit of an imperative from the government to, to, to juice up the numbers who are going to be vaccinated at some point. And in the eyes of most of the public, as you said, 81 to, to 19, they're saying that, um, you know, you're, you're not vaccinated until you've had your second dose, which seems to make sense to me. Yeah, Catherine, uh, 
there's been a lot more focus on the actual mechanics of the vaccination rollout and the uh, Victorian outbreak has really, I guess, shown up that a lot was, wasn't was happening that I think perhaps a lot of people had assumed was happening, particularly in aged care. Uh, how much do you think the government is in trouble on the rollout? Oh, I think they've had an extraordinary couple of weeks uh, where um, it's, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, this is in the in the minds of a lot of voters. I would think there's it's it's a very simple issue. It's a you had one job. <laughs> yeah, like it's not more complicated than that. You had one job, uh, and uh, and the difficulties is, I suppose now more people are starting to put together a story that was that was actually quite difficult to put together because it was kind of happening in real time. And making an assessment of it in real time is an inherently fraught and difficult exercise. But now we can put together a story that says, you know, the government lost the race for supply in the middle of last last year, that we were behind the eight ball because we didn't aggressively go after supply as the Brits and the Americans did. Then we've got the model of rollout where the Commonwealth, uh, largely for political reasons, I mean, some, some medical reasons, to be fair, um, uh, when there's vaccine hesitancy, I think the government thought putting out vaccinations through GP clinics would be a good counter to hesitancy. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the method of rollout was the Commonwealth's decision and the state spent months kind of biting their lip, you know, thinking, God, this is going to be a disaster, but let's not have a blue about it. Um, turned out to be uh, highly suboptimal. Morrison had to call in the states and remember the war footing. Uh, that uh, so th then the states had to create the mass vaccination clinics. Um, supply of issues eventually got resolved. We had the AstraZeneca thing in the middle of it. Uh, again, you can sort of plot a path, right, which starts to look not very good. And then, as you said, Eb, we've got the aged care issue that uh, sadly uh, more than six hundred in aged care, residential aged care during the first wave of the pandemic, just any sort of normal, sensible thinking person would think that aged care should be front of mind uh, in terms of, uh, you know, a priority during the lockdown. And of course, the government were telling us that it was a priority. However, there were difficulties with getting the vaccinations happening there. There was a whole debate about workforce. Now, the government says, and it's doubtless true, that the, the health experts gave them advice that you shouldn't vaccinate uh, the workers and the residents at the same time because uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine can really knock people around in terms of symptoms. I can testify it does knock you around. Um, uh, so they didn't want to um, have... Uh, have uh, aged care workers off, you know, dealing with symptoms at the same time as vaccinating patients. I understand these are difficult issues and it points to the vulnerability of, of the aged care sector, the, the amount of problems we've got in the aged care sector. But anyway, sorry, long ramble, which says the government started to take some heat because you could tell a story about the vaccination rollout that seemed pretty compelling in terms yeah. of the deficiencies. So I think that really sort of bit last week and, and was supercharged, I think, as I said at the beginning, by Victoria really calling them out on it, really aggressively calling them out on it in a way that we'd not really seen during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, Pete, we'll go back to these last couple of slides here. Uh, this one, um, do you want to just walk us through some of what we're seeing there? Oh, I think you're on uh, silent there, Pete. I'm buying the drinks. Sorry, everyone. Um, which of the following best describes how quickly the following groups are being vaccinated? Um, more slowly at about the right speed, more quickly. Now, the more quickly is that stubborn 10%, I think, of people that don't believe in the vaccine. So we kind of need to take them out because I don't think anyone that supports vaccines are saying that you're doing it too fast. Um, what stood out here was that sense that a priority really needs to be given to aged care and disability. And just listening to Catherine's um, analysis just there, it does strike me that one of the risks for the government is that access to vaccine becomes a proxy for whether the government cares for different cohorts in the community. Um, do you care about people in aged care? Do you care about people with disability? And I think that there's been a, there's been some and again, full credit to the, the Senate estimate process for some of this scrutiny. But um, 
there have been admissions at various times by authorities that they've determined that dis people with disability and particularly people in um, disability homes um, aren't as big a priority as people with a in aged care homes. And there may be justifications for that, but if you're listening to that and you've got a loved one with a disability or you know someone with a disability, that comes off as um, something that feels less than discharging full responsibility. Mm. Um, I think the short thing here is that, you know, there's, you know, rising a third plus that want to see things getting moved faster. Um, fewer people waving it through with a green light. Um, although interestingly, that number, um, sorry, <laughs> with people aged over 50, um, 35% more slowly, 39 at about the right speed. So, you know, I think there's a few things going on. There's the messaging of the vulnerable. There's actually the logistics of the rollout and people's lived experience when they are trying to book a vaccination. And it's, it's, a, it's a really mixed experience. And then where that lays with political accountability in the long run. Yeah. Um, and we've got a last couple here, kind of more related to Victoria yeah. and the lockdowns. Just want to take us through those and then I think we might get to questions yeah. from the audience. These are just binary. And sometimes when we want to just get a bit of a read, we force people to make a choice. Um, this one's really um, about the um, Victorian pushback on federal government, 55-45, say fair cop, Victoria. And the um, second one is um, the government support. And again, it was 55-45 and that was in the field while that was being played out. And ultimately the government to an extent buckled there. Yeah. Uh, well, we might go now to questions from the audience. As I said, I think we've been up around 650 people joining us today and we've got a lot of good questions here. So thanks very much for coming along everyone. Uh, the first question that I wanted to ask was from Tim Hardy, and it's for you, Catherine. Uh, he says, what is your explanation for the strong resistance by the federal government uh, to setting up a purpose-built quarantine facility uh, around the nation as some of the states have been pushing for? Mm. Uh, look, well, they, they, have in, they have set up one, Howard Springs, in the Northern Territory, uh, but... Uh, that that centre is still not operating at the capacity that their expert Jane Holton recommended that it operate at. So I think it's at about two thousand now. And I, from memory, I don't don't quote me because I don't have the figure in front of me. But I think her recommendation was three thousand. More generally, uh, I think uh, look certainly from the vantage point of the states, uh, the resistance at the Commonwealth level has been political. Uh, I.e., at the moment, the states where all of the downside risks associated with outbreaks from hotel quarantine because the Commonwealth is not running hotel quarantine. That's a state issue. Certainly the states suspect that, that uh, part of the resistance has been not wanting to take on responsibility for outbreaks. There's also been a fair bit of nickel and diming, I think, um, in terms of between the Commonwealth and the states, which is weird when you think about <laughs> how much money we've spent and how big the debt is that you'd be nickel and diming over um, quarantine facilities sounds a bit weird, but yeah, um, but when there's hundreds know. of billions of dollars uh, yeah. going out the door, <laughs> <laughs> it seems a bit weird. Uh, but anyway, I guess look, a budget repair has to start somewhere. Anyway, uh, but uh, that's been um, that that's certainly been again from the vantage point of the states one of the issues. Like the that Victorian deal was going to be announced, I think uh, every day for the last three weeks. Uh, but it really went right down, hey, terrible cliche, apologies in advance, right down to the wire of the National Cabinet meeting uh, last Friday for, for that to be actually sorted. And they were still hip and shoulder charging one another, the jurisdictions on Thursday night yeah. uh, about how that would be resolved. So, uh, so I think certainly from the States, that's, that has been their very distinct impression, political risk and nickel and diming. Yeah. Um, John, I think this question is for you and maybe you can look up uh, this while we're talking and go to the next one. Um, so we've got a few people asking there about 
Um, what's the socioeconomic breakdown or is there any kind of demographics that come through for people who are most resistant to the vaccine rollout? I'm not sure if you've got that to hand. Yeah, I've got a few figures here. Um, so there's two things with hesitancy. It's I would get vaccinated, but not straight away. And I would never get vaccinated. So I think whether or not it's hesitancy or um, I guess anti-vaxxing, um, there's two um, elements there. In terms of the hesitancy that I would want to get vaccinated, but, but perhaps not straight away, the two main demographics we've identified there, one we've already talked about, those pe people aged 18 to 34, and we are seeing a shift there as they're becoming more enthusiastic about it. The second group are women. So 41% um, of women say they would get vaccinated, but not straight away, compared to 30% of men. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder if that's uh, a lot to do with um, perhaps the impacts if you're thinking about falling pregnant and other things or just the general ways in which the medical industry lets down women from time to time uh, might be a, a few reasons behind that. Um, the next couple of questions, I might start with you, Pete, here and then come to you, Catherine. It's about what, if anything, uh, would enable Anthony Albanese to cut through, uh, given that seems to be eluding him? And also, is that cut through problem more general for oppositions or is it about uh, him personally? Pete, is there anything from the data, from the polling that could tell us about that? I'll put two things out there which are kind of different. One is around party um, brand and the other is actually around personal brand. So around the party brand, I, I do write in my Guardian piece today, I think the challenge for the Morrison government as people expect government to actually deliver on infrastructure of health, um, on quarantine, on vaccines is that you've actually got a government that really doesn't believe in government. Like the, the mission of these right of, of centre um, political parties around the Western world over the last 30 years has been smaller government, less taxes. Remember last election was all about lower taxes. Yes, they pumped money in to keep the show afloat because they had no other option, but in their DNA, they don't really believe the government's solution. If they can find some, a way to outsource responsibility or privatise a service, they'll do it. And I think some of the issues that we're actually seeing, you know, the, the logistic rollout of vaccines is being done by a whole bunch of different private providers that all have different protocols in place. The amount of money being spent on consultants to come up with plans and then whether or not they land in the public sector, who knows? Um, and likewise, the reliance on hotel quarantine is really going through commercial providers rather than finding a fit for purpose public health solution. Um, so I think there is an opportunity as the year unfolds to hold the government accountable for their lack of commitment to government. Um, the second thing is more personal. I'm a big advocate that Albo needs to go the full Albo. Um, one of the really superficial parts of politics is most people link politics to an individual. The last three times Labor won power. Gough Whitlam, it's time. Bob Hawke, who was a human brand who had been up there getting wage cases for generations of Australians and the total constructed Kevin 07 brand. But each of those linked a big leadership brand with a set of policies. I think Labor never took the time to brand Bill Shorten, firstly because they thought he wasn't going to win against Turnbull and then because they thought he was going to win against Morrison. But the first thing Morrison went did when he got power was to go the full ScoMo. And it sounds superficial and to this audience probably a little bit beneath politics, but unless you can wrap up a personality in something with a few letters that actually gives a, a sense of the, the leader... I think you're struggling. And at the moment, I still feel Anthony Albanese as he comes across is still a bit unknown. Whereas those of us closer to politics knows there is an elbow that could be amplified as someone who started on the wrong sides of the tracks, knows where he came from and, and has quite a compelling narrative. And I think they're starting to get to that. But I think that merging of the, the weakness of the government, not believing in government, and the benefits in building up. If you're going to stick with Albo as your leader, like you've got to go all in. So 
sorry, I went off on a bit of a rave there, but I no, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, I mean, uh, people old enough would, would remember Cabin 07. Like Labor has, you know, no, been known to put in some big branding efforts uh, in the past. But uh, Catherine, what's your view on Albo's cut through and the possibilities there, or the barriers? Uh, very quiet chuckle to myself remembering those commercials of Kevin Rudd where he appeared on his porch in Queensland and said, some may call me an economic conservative. Uh, <laughs> until that moment, no one knew who he was. Um, anyway, um, that's, uh, sorry, that was just, uh, that's just showing my age. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in terms of the cut through point, um, look, it is, it is really difficult. It's not like they haven't been showing up doing the work because they, they absolutely have. Uh, in terms of how um, how you sort of grab the attention, it's sort of the most it's the most precious commodity in an oversaturated universe is how you compete for people's attention, right? It's sort of um, and and Pete's got an idea about branding that uh, sounds logical to me. I think partly um, the strategy. Uh, from Albanese has been to not ratchet up his negatives. If we go back, well, we don't need to physically yet, but if we go back in our minds to the slide about Anthony Albanese and approval, uh, he's had this consistent level of around 25% of people who don't have a view about him one way or the other. Anthony's, uh, Anthony Albanese's strategy has been to not sort of ratchet up his own negatives because that was very problematic for Bill Shorten. People knew who Bill Shorten was, but they thought he was negative or or whatever they thought about him, right? Albanese has been trying to make sure that once he hits the, the business end of the political cycle, that he's not so weighted by negatives that he, he literally has no chance of trying to come up uh, against Morrison in the contest. Now, but the thing is, uh, I think there is a realisation, well, not a realisation because that makes it sound as though they haven't thought about it. I think there is, um, in the Labor Party at the moment, they know that there's that one of the things they will have to do in order to make the case for change, and that's what any alternate government has to do, present a compelling change case to the people of the country. Otherwise, the government doesn't change. So you can do that positively with, with some policies. You can also do it negatively in the sense that there is a, a record of the governments there to prosecute and some deficiencies in terms of the prime minister's performance and what the government has or hasn't done. When you kind of switch over into negative territory and you see Labor if you watch politics closely and I get like a lot of people on this forum will be watching politics closely you will have seen Labor is starting to muscle up more aggressively against Scott Morrison and his record on the pandemic and other things uh, that's they have to do it but it's risky territory because then you get into the negative perceptions because people don't like politicians going nye, 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 right so it's sort of like I don't have a smart you know, thunderbolt about um, what I would do if I were Anthony Albanese, but I kind of understand the strategy to date. So the interesting thing to watch, I, I suppose, is to what extent that they can start to prosecute the government's record without taking on water themselves. Mm. And, and um, I'm trying to say, I mean, I think going back to the original um, analysis of today that we're not where we were 12 months ago actually vindicates what Catherine's talking about. So I think Labor made the call last year that the only thing you can do in opposition during a global pandemic is make yourself unfit for office any time in the future, which the Victorian opposition achieved um, with remarkable acquittry. Um Labor's in the game. They've just got to find... Um, a couple of markers to to really hold the government to account on and the government's giving them heaps of opportunities now yeah so that was the next two questions which are kind of linked that I wanted to ask about um Catherine we've got Kate Crawford here uh asking about why there's no discussion of the limits of the protection of vaccines I actually want to put that to the side and focus on the second part of her question which is the impact of the aged care workforce structure and how it's dominated by part-time and casual uh, a lot of people on labor hire contracts for example rather than permanently employed uh, people through an aged care facility and how that's contributed to the original um, outbreaks in Victoria and that huge death toll that we saw and also Pete mentioned before uh, you know the idea that the government is really privatizing a lot of the vaccine rollout um, and overly relies on, you know, consultants and things like that. How much are those issues, I guess, coming 
back to bite the government at the moment uh, as we learn more from the Victorian outbreak. Yeah, well, well, aged care is a real thing. Aged care, the vulnerabilities in the aged care system, I think many Australians have first-hand experience of. So many people understand that that whole sector is held together with, you know, sticky tape and a couple of matchsticks and a few band-aids here and there. Uh, and it's and it's appalling and abhorrent. Uh, and to the extent that we saw uh, the, the government uh, commit $18 billion uh, in order to uh, shore up the aged care sector. Now, that's not nearly enough and not as much as the Royal Commission recommended. And uh, what the government's not doing in terms of the Aged Care Royal Commission recommendations is significant is as significant as what they are doing. Uh, and I think uh, Labor is already prosecuting the gap between those two things. And yeah, look, our questioner is correct. Uh, what the pandemic has shown is the vulnerabilities in that sector. And it's, it's red hot in the sense that everybody knows firsthand the vulnerabilities in that sector and can easily imagine the horror of having elderly parents in residential aged care in the middle of a COVID outbreak. It's pretty bloody mm. awful. Um, yeah. So, and, and again, I think, uh, you know, it's the government, the government has a case to answer. The, the government certainly has a case to answer. Uh, yeah. A lot of those problems became really obvious last year. And then with this next outbreak, you know, we're still having workers working in multiple facilities uh, through labour hire companies. Like there's a real failure there to learn the lessons from the problems that that went wrong last time. Uh, the Australian Institute Centre for Future Work has done a fair bit of uh, work around um, some of those issues, which I would encourage people to check out. Catherine, I've got a, maybe a quick one for you here from Karen Douglas. She says, do you have a sense how or if Tony Smith's direction to Scott Morrison to answer the question during question time has shifted the way the LNP operates in the House and has it reinforced the requirement for them to be accountable, and more or less accountable in question time, Catherine? Yeah, no, I'm so glad I got that question because at the beginning when I did the recap of the last two weeks, I did forget Tony Smith and his one-person uh, campaign to make question time slightly more appalling than it is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, look, I think this is a really significant move by the Speaker. I don't think that it will, um, that it will change everything uh, and, uh, and it sort of, in a way, depends on whether or not Smith really wants to stay the course on this one-man campaign, but I think he's showing every sign of wanting to stay the course. Uh, I think it's really important because uh, we'd sort of gotten to the point where the dreaded alternative approaches, which is what is, is added to the end of a Dorothy Dixer question, had become, I said this in a column at the weekend, it had become the political equivalent of a coward's punch. It was really, uh, it was, it, it's really bad what was happening in question time. And uh, I've been in the place for a long, long time and I cannot for the life of me, fathom why the current generation of politicians uh, chooses to be their most obnoxious uh, and awful and uh, studiously avoiding accountability at the precise moment in the day where people are tuning in. I, I just think it's insane. Uh, and uh, evidently so does Tony Smith. Now, um, one person from the presiding chair cannot change the tenor and tone of politics forever and, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. But uh, he was very, very forceful over this parliamentary fortnight. I, I can't, I'm sure there'll be people in the chat with better memories than me that might be able to remember a speaker sitting down a prime minister. But I tell you what, if it's happened, it's been a long time since, uh, <laughs> since we've seen that. And not only Morrison, but Greg Hunt, I think, got sat down on three separate occasions. Uh, he was, you know, he was taking the role. He was naming names. Yeah. And I absolutely applaud him for doing that because it did actually make a, a difference. Uh, if you sort of, if you ever bored one day and you want to do question time recaps, if you look at the, the question time that, that happened at the beginning of the sitting fortnight to the question time that happened at the end of the sitting fortnight, there was a demonstrable difference in tone and any 
you know, anytime someone put a toe over the line, Smith was there to with his hammer ready to bring it down. It was anyway, it's fascinating. Really. Yeah. Um, just quickly to wrap us up, I've got a question here from um, George Votsarakis, who says, given the comment on the fracturing of national unity, is the Federation still relevant? I guess I want to ask you, Pete, first, and then I'll get you, Catherine, to wrap up. I mean, I think we've seen the states just have a much huger role in politics over the last couple of years, even through things like the bushfires. You know, it was really the states um, who step up during those kinds of things. Um, do you want to comment on, on that, Pete, the, <laughs> the nature of the Federation? Well, the Federation was an accommodation between the states um, to set up a, a national government that built in their long-term relevance. So the Constitution sets up the key parts of the delivery of health services, education, a whole bunch of areas are really state responsibility. And I think what we discovered last year is when the rubber hits the road, state government is where um, things are things go when when you really need government support. The federal government has traditionally been the raiser of the, the funds for state government services and the um, the body that 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 represents our interests and internationally and and via defence and via trade and really important roles but different roles. We saw actually through the GFC when the Labor government tried to roll out a whole bunch of services through the federal government that things got a little bit messy um, and. I think that's also part of what we're seeing at the moment that the federal government isn't set up for the sort of service delivery that our states are. We're that, not after hollowing out the public service for- Well, indeed, <laughs> but maybe never. Um, so national cabinet was, a, was really, I think, a reassertion of that partnership between states and the feds. There's a bit more friction there now. And that's not a bad thing, but you know, in terms of is federation dead, I don't think anyone's seriously considering, you know, the old abolish the states theory from, you know, a couple of decades back. I don't see anyone seriously considering that now or pro proposing that. Yeah, Catherine, what about you? State of the federation? <laughs> well, I think obviously we've been talking about a fracturing and a, and a shift in the pan the politics of the pandemic, uh, but I actually think the federation proved its worth. To the Australian people over the last 18 months. Uh, I think there were a lot of dialogues in the Federation over the last 18 months that were really important and, uh, and yielded uh, good results. Uh, you know, the states, the states bailed out Scott Morrison, poor decisions on more than one occasion. Uh, the Commonwealth also came to the party with a really significant fiscal response, which uh, wouldn't have happened without that dialogue with the states again. Um, I actually think we've been lucky that uh, we haven't had a system of government where there's uh, very limited checks and balances because I think in some, you can sort of see the worst of the Federation in America, although what Biden's done with the vaccination rollout is just staggering. I mm -hmm. mean, just absolutely staggering achievement. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in Britain, you can see the sort of uh, the, the uh, risks associated with not having an active and robust dialogue between tiers of government. So I'm a bit of a Federation fan, I've got to say. Yeah. Um, we've got more questions here on uh, what's happening currently to the family from Billa Wheeler and their young daughter who's in uh, has to be rushed to hospital after not getting access to medical care and a whole bunch of other questions here that I'm really sorry that we can't get to. Uh, for my part, I'll say what I think is happening to that family is appalling uh, without asking anyone else to comment on that or knowing, I don't think it matters what the public thinks about it. I think that's just appalling, but uh, it has been a big couple of weeks uh, of politics. So thank you very much, John Remington, Pete Lewis and Catherine Murphy for joining us today. Thanks everyone for all your wonderful questions. I know there was about 650 people on with us today. That's just uh, a huge turnout. So we really appreciate your interest. Um, thank you for your great questions. As always, sorry, we couldn't get to them. We've got another Another exciting webinar uh, tomorrow and an excellent one coming up next week. Tomorrow we're going to be talking to two clean tech entrepreneurs 
Uh, if you, like me, get depressed about climate politics in Australia, I think this is going to be a really good one to tune into uh, with Saul Griffiths and Danny Kennedy. Uh, I'm really excited about that. That's 11 a.m. tomorrow. You can find those details on our website. And the week after that, we'll be talking to renowned Australian author Richard Flanagan about his new book, Toxic that really looks at uh, the rotten underbelly, as he calls it, of the Tasmanian salmon industry, which is sold to a lot of us as being clean and green. It turns out that's not so much the case uh, once you uh, look under the covers a little bit. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our podcast, Follow the Money, if you can find that. Uh, it's on Apple Podcasts or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And I'll make one last plea. Uh, it is the end of financial year appeal for the Australia Institute. Um, thanks to two generous donors, all donations will be matched dollar for dollar between now and June 30. That means if you give the Australia Institute 30 bucks, uh, we get 60 bucks actually. So it's uh, you can double your impact there. Please head on over to our website to donate or to sign up for our future webinars. Um, and thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully we see you tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Sure.